Um, so Winfried uh, heads the Sussex Iron Quantum Technology Group and is the director of the Sussex Centre for Quantum Technologies. But the talk today is based on, I guess, his other hat. So he was also the co-founder, chairman and chief scientist at Universal Quantum. Universal Quantum are a full stack quantum computing company aiming to build a million qubit quantum computer through the trapped iron platform. So Winfred, if you're ready, then please take it away. Great. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Let me let me just uh, share my screen. Right. So here we go. Do the thing. And bring that up. Good. Okay, um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, the work within Universal Quantum uh, to build practical quantum computers. So let me just start um, by giving you uh, some background. So, <clears throat> so in, in quantum computing, there's uh, two computational regimes. One um, often referred to as NISC, um, <clears throat> where you don't correct for the inherent errors in all the operations. Uh, but that means you're kind of limited to the number of operations and with that or the number of qubits you can use. And so that means you have very limited uh, abilities applications. So most of the applications you've heard of in quantum computing are actually belonging to what's referred to as fault tolerant quantum computing, where you correct for the inherent operations, uh, errors within all the operations. Uh, there's a price you pay for that, and that is you have to have lots and lots of extra qubits. And um, when I say lots and lots, um, you tend to get to numbers like millions or even billions of qubits. Um, and that is really the regime which you associate with most of the applications in, in quantum computing. And, and, and so I wanted to start with that because um, <clears throat> this is in a way the reason why at, at Universal Quantum, um, we maybe uh, have a different ambition than, than in other quantum computing um, companies in the sense that we really focus on developing technology capable of scaling truly to millions of qubits. And, and, and so that's really in a way uh, who we are and our identity. And, and let me now tell you a little bit about how we are trying to actually do that. So, so how do you make practical quantum computing a reality and again practical quantum computing in, in my mind <coughs> really does imply you have to have full tolerant operation. So, so why, why do we think uh, we can scale to a million qubits and, and, and the answer lies within uh, six distinct technology pillars and I'm gonna uh, introduce them now uh, in order to explain the technology in a way in how we're building uh, practical quantum computers. So let's start with the first one and that is uh, mild cooling technology. And, and so <clears throat> that is uh, kind of very straightforward and very simple. Um, most quantum computing platforms you have heard of or you're aware of require millikelvin temperatures and that in terms means that there's very limited cooling power available, typically, typically maybe a bunch of milliwatts of cooling power. And that means you're very limited in, in how much you can cool or how many qubits you can ev ev eventually uh, 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 manipulate. And, and, and so we really follow a very different approach, uh, inherently room temperature approach, but in terms of the classical electronics, we are using cooling to around 70 uh, Kelvin and at that kind of temperature, you have around six orders of magnitude more cooling power available than, than uh, in the dilution refrigerator. And that again implies you can scale to large numbers of qubits. So the platform we use are trapped ions and, and, and there's a very good reason for that. Uh, these ions levitate above the surface of a microchip and that means they're not coupled to the microchip. And that in turn again means we are able to produce extremely good system specifications. And as you probably know, trapped ions have the world records in all the key specifications, such as uh, two qubit gate error, error uh, two qubit gate fidelity, single qubit gate fidelity, and then things like connectivity, which is very important. So the uh, ability to interact one qubit with any other qubit, and that's the shuttling approach which we pursue, allows for extremely wide connectivity, not just for nearest neighbor connectivity, as in many solid state implementations. 
So the, the idea is uh, encompassed really in this picture. So you have a, a micro, silicon microchip and the ions are levitating above the surface of this chip. Um, you have now zones where you uh, execute quantum gates, zones where you read out and zones where you load because even in the best vacuum, every so often you will lose your ions. Now, uh, one of the ways how we distinguish ourselves from all other competitor, competitors is the idea of executing electronic quantum gates. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a good reason why that's important. So traditionally, trap ion quantum computing is done by aligning pairs of laser beams onto the position of a trapped ion. And if you have 10 or 100 qubits or thousands of qubits, maybe that's no problem because you're just going to align all these pairs of laser beams with an accuracy of 10 microns. But imagine trying to build a quantum computer with millions of qubits. Would it be possible to align all these pairs of laser beams and stabilize their power uh, phase and, and uh, sufficiently in order to for quantum compute computation to happen? So, so we really think when you scale up, you need a different approach. And so we've invented this idea of, of quantum gates that can be executed by simply applying static voltages onto a microchip. So we don't need to apply any microwaves either to the chip. We have global microwave fields that are emitted by antenna. And that again means like it's very simple to build the ele electronic infrastructure to build such a quantum computer. Now, um, the <coughs> idea of these electronic quantum gates, if you're interested, is encompassed in this in this picture, which I'm showing here. Uh, but maybe let me let me start with the headlines, and and, and that is <coughs> that the number of radiation fields, so whether it's microwaves applied to a chip or lasers um, lasers applied, does not scale with a number of qubits. And it's really important if you think about um, really building a large scale quantum computer, because if you have a million microwave fields or a million microwave boxes, you can imagine that's a very hard thing to do, a million lasers. So, so we don't have that scaling and, and the technology we use is very similar indeed. Uh, that's uh, what is in your inside your mobile phone. Now, the picture on the right kind of shows you how that works. And what we do is we use a static magnetic field gradient. And by placing the ion in a particular part of the static magnetic field gradient, um, we can now change the frequency splitting of our qubit. So a larger magnetic field will lead to a larger splitting. And so by placing our ion in a particular spot of this magnetic field gradient, by applying a particular voltage to the electrodes, we can now make this ion resonant with global microwave fields and so execute simply by applying a voltage, either a single qubit gate or two qubit gate. And so you can now see that these global fields, they, uh, the number of these global fields does not depend on the number of qubits anymore. And that makes this approach very scalable. So how do you go about building something like that? So that's a rather theoretical idea. And, and so we've developed a blueprint of how that can be done. And inherently in that blueprint is the idea of silicon microchip modules and these microchip modules uh, in, incorporate at the surface an array of X junction, X junctions, maybe a few hundred or thousand X junctions with hundreds of thousands of ions on each module. Uh, below the surface, there's digital to analog converters allowing us to apply voltages to these, each of these electrodes. And below that, we need the ability to actually calculate these voltages via some ASICs or FPGAs. And all of that is now a lot of high density electronics and we need some cooling for that. And that's the reason why we cool to 70 Kelvin because silicon at 70 Kelvin actually has a very high heat conductivity. And that in turn means like we can very efficiently take the heat away from all this classical electronics. So that's the kind of idea of these silicon microchip modules. There are some more details in terms of uh, integrated detectors, ovens and so on, but I won't go into much detail. A second part, and maybe the next pillar I'd want to discuss, is the idea of modularity. So quantum computing architectures have to be modular because um, however many qubits you're going to fit on one commercial wafer, eventually you want more than that number of qubits. And so you need to have some, some kind of modular structure. In trapped ions, indeed, there is two modular architecture. And one 
is the famous photonic interconnect architecture, which is encompassed in the Oxford 2020 engine, where you make use of optical fibers to connect one module with another module. In fact, you then entangle one eye on one module with an eye on the other module by coincident detection of the photons and pair of detectors. The challenge about this technique is that even after 15 years of development, the world record of entangling two ions is at a speed of 180 per second at 94% fidelity, leading to a few tens per second after distillation. And that's very slow. Also, the engineering to actually accomplish something like that is extremely complicated. So we came up as a, with an alternative approach where we simply shape the electrodes on the edge of each quantum computing module in such a way that we can now produce electric field links between quantum computing modules to simply transport ions from one quantum computing module to another quantum computing module. And that can be done with orders of magnitude increased speed compared to photonic interconnects, whereas requiring much, much simpler engineering. And all of that also allows variable connectivity, nearly all to all connectivity and uh, for qubit numbers, maybe below a thousand. And that is obviously very powerful to execute practical algorithms. Now that's an idea. Now I want to show you the, <clears throat> the execution. So that's uh, a microchip we produced within the research group at Sussex, uh, an edge microchip where we in, in fact demonstrate this concept. And here you can actually see the quantum computing prototype where we've now implemented um, and so we have a two module quantum computer prototype where we are now testing these concepts. And in fact, I can report that as of two weeks ago, we've managed to trap on this prototype and now we're starting to actually shuttle between these modules. Now, one something which distinguishes ourselves, um, our company from others is the idea that we really very much focus, focus on the appropriate engineering and that's encompassed in this blueprint we published in 2007, but I want to show you also how this now really translate into the daily work. And so that's the idea of an X junction in with, in which incorporate current current wires. And you can see here a microchip on the right, which we produced inside the research group, which encompasses now these current current wires and encompasses an X junction. Um, <clears throat> you can see a picture of the idea of having electronics below the surface, also detectors. And again, now here are the first chips, which incorporate uh, cavities in order to now allow the incorporation of these detectors. All of that maybe can be easily understood by uh, looking at this film, this very short film, where you see how this architecture comes together. So it's a, a, a set of X junctions. We load ions within uh, this architecture, as you can see two ions, one of them is a sympathetic cooling ion. Below the surface, we have these current carrying wires, making use of them in global microwave fields. We can now entangle two ions. And, and after we've completed the entanglement operation, again, we have further ion transport processes, for example, in this case here to the detection zone, where we have got, we have got a detector integrated in the surface of the silicon microchip. And these detectors don't have to be very good because obviously we have a lot of fluorescence coming. We use, still use some laser beams, they are global laser beams, so they're much simpler to manipulate and can be used for thousands of ions. Uh, a quantum algorithm looks like this, but in, in a way all these ions moving in parallel within this array of X junctions. And so it's a little bit like a game of Pac-Man really. And this goes, uh, happens on one of these quantum computing modules, but obviously one of these modules can only hold maybe a few hundred or a few thousand, thousands of, of ions. So in order to scale this, we place uh, two quantum computing modules adjacent on a, on a frame and making use of piezoelectric transducers. We are now able to align one module with respect to the other module. Now, if these modules are uh, misaligned and we can't have these electric field links, and you can see we can't shuttle the ions, but by simple alignment with an accuracy of around 10 micrometers, we can now align the modules and then transport ions from one module to another module. And so that's kind of the picture. And you can see how this now very easily scales to large numbers. Once you've produced one of these modules with high yield, you can now just add more and more modules. And this is where, in a way, maybe the importance of universal quantum as a company comes in, because obviously something like that you can't do in a university a research environment. You really need commercial foundries, with, which we work with now, in order to make this happen. So as a company, obviously, we are uh, in a different way um, 
we are we are very different to a research group and, and one of the uh, highlights is that we have uh, really fantastic investors the village global backed by jeff bezos mark zuckerberg hoxton which has funded deliveroo propagate a fantastic quantum fund seven percent which is uh, given rise to Oculus Rift, uh, founders X, a, a fund from the Valley. So, so make building up a company very much incorporates uh, was makes it extremely important to have a lot of support to help us make the right hires. And we've now employed a set of world leading engineers who really uh, in the middle of producing. Uh, together with uh, commercial foundries, these electronic quantum computing modules. And, and I think <clears throat> um, that kind of um, brings me to the end of my talk. So, so we are a trapped iron quantum company, quantum computing company, um, building practical quantum computers capable of scaling to millions of qubits. We believe that's very critical. Uh, uh, having the idea of really scaling to these large numbers. So our technology is based on the trap iron platform and that tra platform already delivered world records and nearly all important specifications. So there's still many challenges and we are addressing these using six di distinct technology pillars, which are unique for the work in universal quantum. I've been very lucky to have attracted the interest of some really fantastic investors who um, uh, funded us during the seed phase, and now we are just about to engage in Series A. So I think um, this is a careers um, talk, and so maybe I should say a little bit about what it means to work in a, in a quantum computing company. Uh, the big difference to working in a university is that you have a whole different range of resources available. You work with the very best engineers available and you have the unique possibility to, to, rather than maybe dream of building a quantum computer or produce proof of principle devices, you have really the capability of actually going for it and building devices that can use, can do useful things and, and maybe change the world like that. So, so this is maybe like my short summary of what we do as a company, but, but very happy to, to, to answer uh, as many questions as, as you like. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Winfrey. That was great. Uh, we've got loads of questions in the Q&A, so I'll just put a few of those for, to you for a few minutes, if that's okay. Please, absolutely. So the first one uh, is regarding piezoelectric modules. So how scalable is it to control piezoelectric modules and how many of these modules have you been able to use simultaneously? So, so the piezoelectric modules, so let me just go back to, to show, you, show you where these actually located. Um, so, so in principle, you wouldn't need any piezoelectric modules. You could literally just put these modules on, onto a frame and, and even mechanical engineering is very easily capable of, of aligning or, or machining with an accuracy of 10 microns. The reason why you'd want to have them anyway is because of thermal variation. So imagine building a quantum computer, not just with two modules, but with hundreds or thousands of these modules. And you're going to have some kind of thermal variation. You're going to bake this thing and do all sorts of things with it. So you, then you really want to have the ability to on the run control this. So that's why we really have these piezos. And, and, and every, every of these modules will essentially have four piezos. And, and the, the, this is really only to compensate for thermal variations. And, and, and so there's nothing uh, not scalable on having these. There's literally four cables coming out, which, which go to a source. And we can, using optical means, um, or interferometric means we can assure that these, these uh, the models, modules are lined up. Right, thanks. Um, so the next question is regarding the number of qubits that you have. So like what's your current you know, benchmark of qubits on your systems? Um, so <clears throat> it's a very good question and in a way it relates to the strategy of many quantum computing companies. So you've probably heard of uh, Honeywell announcing a quantum volume, new quantum volume, you've heard of Google announcing, I don't know, 72 or 83. And, and um, obviously we could, we could engage like that as well. We could, we could build small proof of principle experiments where we also then try to compete with that and maybe try to go for 95 qubits in order to have 10 more than Google. But we feel uh, this is not the right approach for us when you want to really try to scale to millions of qubits. So, so having some type of linear way to scale, we don't believe is the best way to build, go to a full tolerant device. So what we really focus on as a company is not to build small 
proof of principle demonstrators as other companies to and and to maybe do interesting work in NISC. Uh, uh, I think it's very nice and very useful <coughs> and also helps to bring people into the field. So I'm very thankful to IBM and Google and other companies to do that. But it's not really what we believe in is the best and fastest way to build photo and quantum computers. So we very much focus on the engineering <coughs> and we very much focus to build very first fully electronic quantum computing modules. And <coughs> as you can see in the way we scale this year, the key is not so much how many qubits you can fit one of these on one of these modules, but the key is to build one of these modules with high enough yield that you can just reproduce these modules. If you have a perfectly reproducible module with only a hundred qubits, then you can just add, as you can, as you've seen in the scaling approach, you're just going to add more and more of these modules. As, one, as soon as you can produce a one of these modules with perfect yield, it doesn't matter how many qubits you have, you just add in more and more modules because there's no price to pay for to shuttling between modules and to shuttle between in on side of a module. The, the the time scale is actually more or less the same. That's maybe really the big highlight of this approach. And so what we're really focusing right now as a company to really very much develop these modules with high enough yield. And we do this with, with uh, commercial foundries in order to have the right means to do so. And we, we are fortunate enough to have now the, the funding to, to engage with these foundries. And so this is, uh, I believe, a better approach to scale to very large qubit numbers. Thanks, Winfred. I think we've got time for one more question. So someone's mentioned, uh, will Universal Q ever have a quantum computer on the cloud? Yeah, I think this is uh, exactly the likely or the initially the only way we're going to engage. So <clears throat> building quantum computers is is challenging in, in these machines, especially the beginning, going to be quite unwieldy, big, and, and not something you necessarily want to have at home in your, in your living room or, or anywhere else. And so <clears throat> the way you engage with quantum computers is via the cloud. And so the work we carry out right now is very much to offer quantum computing via the cloud using our advanced technology. Um, there will be certain uh, uh, stakeholders who would like to have their own quantum computer out of some security reasons or, or of some other reasons. And eventually we will cater for these stakeholders to provide a provision where a quantum computer can be deployed uh, <clears throat> in, a, in a, a reasonable environment. Obviously that will then uh, require some, some, a, a certain cost and, and, and a certain provision of services at that type of facility. <clears throat> but really the key provision or the key deployment of, of quantum computing is via the cloud. And so we are working now <clears throat> to provide uh, quantum computing provisions via the cloud. Great, great answer. I think we're gonna uh, wrap it up there if that's okay.